All right. Good evening. It's dark out there. I see some of you, but what a blessing. Man, I'm excited to see so many of you coming out. Still love the country, still love the Lord, still love the principles this nation was built upon. My kind of folks, so I'm thrilled to be with you. I actually drove, hey, hang on, i got to grab my, is this going to squeal if I grab my clicker down there? I forget, or you can throw it, I'll catch. There we go. All right, we, we, uh, we were driving here as quickly as we could because this morning my first grandchild was born. Thank you very much. Yes. Richard Arlen Green the fourth has has joined us. So four of us, the Texas is in trouble. Let me tell you right now. But uh, but we're real excited about that kind of kind of our opportunity to uh, uh, populate Texas with more conservative, constitutional uh, kind of folks. I'm pretty sure right when he was born, I heard him say Constitution. It was a, it, it, maybe not. It might have been something else. But uh, at any rate, uh, it, it is great to be with folks that 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 want to see the nation turned around. I was I was thinking even as we were saying the, the pledges. I, I love being at a place that'll say the Texas pledge as well. When I travel around the country, they just don't get it. I mean, they, they, they think we Texans are obnoxious. I try to explain to them, look, there's only two kinds of people in the world. There's Texans, and there's those that want to be Texans. <laughs> That's it. It's only, only two categories as far as we're concerned. We're very, I, I think we might even be a little bit obnoxious about this Texas thing, but that's okay. Um, you know, even when we brag, my mom always said, if it's true, it ain't bragging. So when we talk about how great Texas is, I think we're spot on. I got a little bit of my Texas pride from the, our former president, former governor, W, was, was uh, the governor of Texas when I was in, in the House and, and serving as a legislator. And, and I was doing this documentary on President Reagan, actually. And I, I'd gone around and interviewed people like Dick Cheney and Trent Lott and a lot of these folks that had been congressmen back when Reagan had been president. And so I'm interviewing Dick Cheney, have no idea the man's going to become vice president. It was back before he, he ran for vice president with W. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing the interview, and I notice he's got a white phone on his desk, and this phone had a halo on it, which I'd never seen before. I was kind of curious. So I said, you know, Mr. Secretary, he's former Secretary of Defense. I said, what's with the phone? He said, son, that's a direct line to God. <laughs> he said, you can use it, but make sure you pay me back. That thing's 500 bucks a minute. I said, 500 bucks a minute? That's expensive. I made the call, paid him, got back to Texas. I'm interviewing George W., and, and he's got a white phone on his desk. I said, Governor, I, I want to use your direct line to God before I, I leave. Can I make a call? And he said, yeah, you've got to pay me back. He said, that thing's expensive. He said, that thing's five bucks a minute. I said, wait a minute, Governor. I was with the Secretary of Defense. I said, that's all the states. Your governor of one state, his was 500 bucks a minute. Yours is only five bucks. Explain. He said, boy, you've forgotten where you are. He said, this is Texas. God's country, local call from right here. <laughs> he laughed. He thought that was pretty funny. So now that might be bragging, all right, because that, that part might not be completely true. But look, as proud as I am to be a Texan, and I, and I think maybe you'll, you'll agree with me, as, as, as a lot of people across the country I think still do, as proud as I am to be a Texan, I am very proud to be an American. Are you still proud to be an American? I know we got some challenges. we got some difficulties. But look, I don't say that just to get you to, to wave the flag. In fact, I say that so that we can start thinking about why that flag is worthy of being waved. When we say we're proud to be an American, what does that mean? I mean, why do we wave this flag? What, is it, what does it stand for? I, I used to go out and give speeches and, and, and talk about being proud to be an American, and people didn't have the same attitude. In fact, first, first time I, I started going out and talking about this kind of stuff, it was after I had seen uh, um, President Reagan give his last public speech. It was, it was 1994, and we're sitting at this big big birthday gala for President Reagan, and, and, and he and Margaret Thatcher haven't come out yet. They're going to give their speeches, and they've got screens like this, and they're playing on these screens some of Reagan's greatest speeches, and they played the one I think is probably the greatest speech he ever gave atop the cliffs there at Pointe de France. The monument was right behind him. This was the spot where Rudder's Rangers, any Aggies in the room? Okay, you know, Rudder? Okay, so Rudder's Rangers, 225 of those guys take these cliffs and literally in that process take back, begin the process of taking back an entire continent for freedom. Only 90 survived the mission. All right, we're sitting here at this big gala, and we're watching Reagan give that speech, and he's recounting the horrific yet heroic events that, that took place that day. And the camera starts to pan across some of those Army Rangers that were seated around him. Only, only like I said, 90 survived. About 15 or 20 were there at this reunion and, and, and listening to the president's speech. And the camera starts panning these guys, and as Reagan is taking us back to those days of sacrifice, every one of these guys had tears welling up in their eyes as they remembered their fallen comrades. I was about 22, 23 years old. I'm watching this on the screen. I had never thought about the price of my freedom. Never thought about the price that other people had paid, the value that I had just in, inherited. And I'm sitting there in my tuxedo. My dad's on my right. And the guy on my left we had brought with us from a little town in, uh, called Athens, Texas, Mr. McCormick. And, and he had been a bomber pilot in World War II, great patriot, great American. And 
I just happened to look over at Mr. McCormick as Reagan is taking us back to those days of sacrifice. And there he is, right there in his tuxedo with this big fancy dinner, just tears running down his face at that dinner. And right then it hit me. The personal sacrifice this man sitting next to me had made for me. This guy was willing to go around the world and die. Willing to lay down his life so that two generations later I could be free. So I could sit at that dinner and enjoy my freedom so that tonight we could gather and exercise our freedom of religion and our freedom of speech and the right to assemble and all of these things. And I said, man, I, I want to I respect what he did. I want to honor what he sacrificed for. So I went home and I said, I'm going to be a student of freedom. I want to, I want to understand what it is. I want to understand how we got it. I want to understand how to protect it. And most importantly, how do we pass it to the next generation? How do we make sure they get it and they're willing to defend it? So I started going out and I'd give speeches and I'd talk about how I was proud to be an American. And man, before 9-11, before we had that renewed patriotism in, in America, when I'd say I was proud to be an American, people would look at me like I was corny. I mean, like I was old-fashioned. I mean, I even had him come up sometimes. One time this guy comes up afterwards, he goes, American? So what? Big deal. What's, what's special about being an American? Why is our way of life any better than anybody else? That's that moral relativism that has taken over our country. Everything's equal. There, there, there's no right or wrong. That, that any value system is the same. American. So what? Now, I, I, I wanted to respond to him the way that I used to respond to folks when I was a legislator. If I got a particularly nasty piece of hate mail, I just sent back a form letter. It said, Dear... Ma'am or sir, I just thought you should know some fool has stolen your letterhead. <laughs> and they're writing ridiculous letters on it, and they're even signing your name. Thought you'd want to know about that. <clears throat> you know, come think about it, that might be why I'm no longer in the legislature. I, I don't know, but I'd be glad to email that. We're, we're, we're failing go. I'll, I'll send that to you. James, I'll send that to you guys so y'all can use it at the, at, in Austin when anybody sends you nasty e Anyway, so look, I, I tried to be a little bit more diplomatic. Said, did I cut it off? I said to, the, said to the guy, I said, let me just ask you some questions. Why do you think we call the last century the great American century? It's because we saved the world. Not once or twice, three times from the evils of Nazism and communism and despotism. Why do you think America, what evidence is there that America's different thing? There's one fact. If nothing else, just think of this. We're the only people on the face of the planet in the history of the entire world, in all of history. The only people to hold a technological advantage in war and not use it for conquest, but instead use it to free and liberate people all over the planet. Think about it. In 1945, we had the bomb, no one else. We could have conquered the entire planet, but what did we do? We took that weapon, we used it to end a war, saving millions of lives. They're trying to change the narrative now and say that Truman was immoral for dropping the bomb. You talk to anyone that served on Iwo Jima or Saipan or any of the Pacific Islands. I get to interview these guys on my radio program all the time. They, we were already building the hospitals on some of these islands to deal with a million more casualties if we had to invade Japan on the ground. We knew they would have millions more casualties. So we dropped the bombs. We saved millions of lives. And then what we do? We took our money and we went and rebuilt the nations that had attacked us. Friends, there is something different about being an American. This is a unique value system. This is a value system worth fighting for. That flag stands for something that matters. You know, when I was a kid, we, even the comic books reinforced this, right? The Superman comic books, what did it say? Truth, justice, and the American way, right? It meant something. We stood for something, and we're losing that. It's, we're, we're losing where we came from. We don't know what these guys actually gave us. See, this system that they faced on the, everywhere on the planet when the Founding Fathers gathered in 1776, everywhere on the planet, this was your model of government. Power and freedom came from God, went to the king, and then the king decided how much freedom you had, what your rights were, what your station in life would be. 56 men said, that's wrong, that's backwards. They said, we, we got this upside down. Power and freedom comes from God, no question. But it goes directly to the people. And then the people give power to government for only one reason, to secure the blessings that God gave us, to secure the rights that God gave us. So we create government. We, we literally institute government in order to protect the freedoms that God gave us. And, and we've lost that idea. About 50 years ago, we started saying, you know, we like freedom. Well, we, we love our, our freedom and our liberty, but we don't like this God thing. You know, having God in the equation is kind of cramping my style. It means there's rules, and, 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 and I want liberty. That means I get to do anything and everything I want, and I don't want to have to answer to anybody. So true freedom means get God out of the equation so I can do whatever feels good to me. But don't worry. We'll still be in charge. We'll still tell the government what to do. 
But see, once we change that part of the formula, took God out of the equation, we've woken up now, and just a few decades later, all of a sudden this whole thing's flipped on its head. And now we have five unaccountable, unelected lawyers in Washington, D.C., making law for 330 million people with no accountability. We've completely lost the system that once said they answer to us, and they can only do what we've given them the authority to do in the Constitution. Now we live under a system that says whatever they wake up and decide, that's how the whole country's going to live. They tell the other branches what to do, and they tell the American people what to do. And it's because we changed the formula. We took God out of the equation, and it's completely changed who we are. I hate to tell you this, but we don't live under the Constitution in America anymore. We live under what I call the Constitution. It's literally whatever these guys wake up and decide they want it to be. And we don't even refer to the document itself in the actual words that our founding fathers gave us. We've got to get back to the foundation. If we want to preserve these things we've been talking about so far tonight, if we want to actually hand this torch to the next generation intact, if we want them to enjoy the freedoms we've enjoyed, we've got to come back to the foundation. That's what this guy right here told us to do. That's, that's actually George Mason. I, I know, look, if, you're ever, if you ever are, are that pale and you have hair that bad, do not sit for a portrait. Just telling you. It'll be with the world from now on. But anyway, here's what he did. He was the father of the Bill of Rights, gave us the Virginia Declaration of Rights, but he was also the champion of the Bill of Rights and, and actually refused to sign the Constitution. One of the 55 that gave it to us actually influenced it greatly. He's also the one that put the Article 5 Convention of States in the Constitution right there on September 14th at the very end of the convention. It said the Federal Congress will never put themselves back in the box. We, the people, through the states, have to put them back in the box. So he's the one that woke up his colleagues and said, we understand the nature of man and the power of man, and you can't leave them with they own the, they're the only ones that can, can restructure the, the foundation. We have to be able to do it. Anyway, here's what he told us I want you to remember tonight, hopefully. He said, no free government. Anybody here want to live in freedom? Six of you. Great. All right. What about the rest of you? All right. No free government, nor the blessings of liberty. Anybody want to enjoy the blessings of liberty? All right, we're up to 10. There we go. We're getting better. If you want to live in freedom and you want to have the blessings of liberty, he says you can't have that unless you have what? A frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. See, what we've done is we don't even teach the principles in the first place in America anymore. We used to at least do it in fifth grade, maybe eighth grade, maybe one time in high school. We've just taken it all out for the most part. What we need to be doing is every year coming back to those principles and instilling them, reminding ourselves and our children and the people in our lives what it is that made America great in the first place. So we've got to know what the formula is that they gave us. You don't become successful as a nation or free as a nation or powerful as a nation by accident. There's a cause for that effect. There's, there's certain principles, there's certain institutions that restrain evil, that encourage prosperity, that encourage freedom. There's certain things that produce good results. And that's what Mason's talking about, the fundamental principles that create a nation you'd want to live in, a community that you would want to live in. And it's all found right there in the heart of the Declaration. It's the 56 words right there, starting with the second paragraph, simply says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator. Right, not their commissioner, not their state rep, not their governor, not their, not their president, certainly not their Supreme Court justice. We're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So right there you got the four basic principles that make up the frame of America, that make this system even possible in the first place. The idea that there's truth, that there is a right and wrong. So this, this moral relativism we bought into, that does not produce prosperity and freedom and liberty and all the things we love. Moral absolutes say there's a truth, and the Founding Fathers were willing to pledge their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to the idea that there is truth. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We've got to come back to that idea that there is a right and wrong. We've got to stop cowering down and being afraid to say, hey, I love you, and because I love you, I'm going to tell you what you're doing is wrong. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your family. It's going to hurt the community. I, I'm not going to just hide in the corner and say, I don't want anybody to say that I'm mean because I'm actually standing up and saying there's truth. We need to be salt and light. We've got to stand up and say we hold these truths to be self-evident. They also said no question about it. God is in the equation of freedom. There's no question. Four times they mentioned the Creator right there in the Declaration of Independence, and, and, and that is the source of truth. Of course, that's where we get the idea of right and wrong. In fact, Washington was pretty, pretty hardcore on this. I mean, he didn't mess around. He, he actually said to the American people in his farewell address, basically saying the same thing I'm saying tonight about there's a formula that produces freedom. And he said, of all the pieces of that formula, let me tell you what the most important part is. Now, he's kind of an important guy, right? I mean, this is the indispensable man. Without him, no revolution. This is the guy, ultimately, that held it all together, not just in winning the revolution, but also the Constitutional Convention and then being the first president and being willing to hand that, that power back, setting a great, 
great precedent for the president. But here's what he said was the key to our formula. He said, of all the habits and dispositions which lead to political prosperity, so of all the pieces of the formula, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Not just okay, not just a, 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 a right that you might have, but a duty because it's indispensable. You can't have liberty if you don't have morality. And you don't have morality if you get rid of religion. And so he's saying, you've got to keep this if you want to be free. And a lot of my friends, they'll say, Rick, you know, hey, man, I was with you up until now. I'm with you on liberty. I'm with you on freedom. But again, you know, get that God. I don't need God in this thing. I can be a patriot without that. Father of the country said you couldn't be. Father of the country said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism that would work to subvert these great pillars. So he said, if you, if you actually work to remove religion and morality from the culture, if you don't support those things and have them as a foundation for the country, you're actually not a patriot. You're actually destroying the very formula that produces liberty. And he said, well, what does he know? I mean, he only gave us the you know, Constitution and won the war for us. Not only that, you know what he's watching? You know what, why he knows this? Because he's watching the French try to get what we've got. He's watching the French Revolution. And the French are over here going, hey, we like the liberty America has. And the American formula was liberty under God, liberty from God, liberty lived out with a respect for the authority guy. And the French are over here going, hey, we like that liberty part, so we'll take that, but nah, we don't want the God part. So they tried liberty without God. What happened? Led to the guillotine, right? Total chaos. Did not work. And Washington's watching that, and he's observing it as a student of history. He's going, hmm, what did they do that was different from us? They wanted what we had. I mean, they even had Lafayette. He went back and wanted, tried to help. He, they wanted what we had. And so he goes, what did they change? What was different? How did they tweak the formula? Very simple. They move, removed God, removed religion. They literally killed all the priests. So he's going, we've got to have religion and morality if we want to be free. So keeping truth, keeping, actually keeping the idea of, of God being in the equation is fundamental to what makes the system work. No question, we're in charge. You guys, I mean, Mark nailed it right at the beginning of the, of the evening. I mean, this system will not last if we are not involved in the process. Here's the good news. The system works, but we have to work the system. See, we've sat back, and most of us have sat, sat out of the system for so long and just complained about what's going on and then say, why is the system not working? Well, it's because we're not working the system. We've got to be engaged in the process, literally standing up and saying, I give my consent for that. I'll support that. Or I refuse my consent for that. I will not support that. Literally making those calls to the city council and the water district and the state legislators and the congressmen and everybody and letting them know, letting that voice be heard, letting our values, literally, I think somebody already said it, values be counted, our voice heard and our, and our values counted. So consent of the governed works, but we got to be engaged in the process for that to work. One of these guys uh, that was president over 100 years ago, James Garfield, also a pastor, by the way, James Garfield put it this way. He said, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. He said, if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's usually when I show a picture of Nancy Pelosi, but I don't think I have it. <laughs> he said, if, it, if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate its recklessness and corruption. He said, if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand, demand these high qualities represented in the national legislature. He said the next centennial, the next centennial. Is that cutting in and out? You got another one? All right, I'll swap out with you. Pass the baton. There we go. Is that better? Okay. So he said if the next centennial, that's us right now. So we are literally, he's almost like a prophet in the White House, right? He's looking at us 100 years later and saying if the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because the people who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation, that's us, because we did not aid in controlling the political forces. Folks, if you look at America right now and you say, are we a great nation? I'd have to say, look, a great nation doesn't kill 60 million of its own. A, a great nation does not start ignoring science and biology and saying anything goes, right? A, a great nation does, does not say, let's give $100 billion to people that want to destroy us. A great nation doesn't do a lot of the things that we've done over the, over the last decade or so. Now, that doesn't mean we can't be a great nation again. I hate to use it point of phrase here, but we can make America great again. I mean, it, it can be done, no question. There's a formula that will produce all of those great results if we'll come back to it, if we'll remind ourselves how it works. But friends, that part of the equation, the creator, cannot be left out. Now, some people say, well, Rick, well, wait a minute. The founders, these guys were all 
atheists and agnostics and Christian, I mean, not Christians. They were, they, they, they were deists. They didn't, we had this unchristian beginning in America. I mean, we indoctrinate our children on college campuses and, frankly, public schools all over the country right now with that kind of philosophy. So if they weren't Christians, if they weren't men of faith, then this system, we shouldn't be talking about that. We shouldn't be bringing that into government. That's what so many people in America today believe. In fact, I kind of bought that lie when I was in law school. I went to law school right here in Texas, and, man, everybody's telling me that. And then finally I said, you know what, instead of listening to that professor, I think I'll go read the founders themselves. I think I'll actually see what they had to say. These guys were nuts. They said crazy things like the general principles upon which the founders achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Wait a minute, if we're founded on Christian principles, why can you not even say the name Jesus Christ at a high school graduation anymore? Why would we say, right? If we're, if we're founded on Christian principles, how do you get a girl, get up to, she gets up in the graduation and because she mentions her faith in Jesus Christ as part of what made her successful in, in, stud, in her studies, that afterwards the school says, you have to issue a public apology or we will not give you your diploma. How do we, I'll tell you how we get there. We go from a place of being founded on Christian principles to a, a place where you can't mention his name because we don't know our history. We don't know what these guys actually said or did or believed or how they acted, the laws they put in place. In fact, we don't even know who most of them were, right? And so I, I want to try to capture the founders for you here in just a couple of minutes. Now, this is a challenge. 256 guys, 247 guys considered to be the founders, the signers of the deck and the Constitution and the major generals of the time, the governors, all the key players. Uh, and, and actually, I think I could cover them, Mark, if we go until about 2 a.m. Have we got some coffee back there for everybody? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover as many as I can in just a few minutes. This is why David Barton and I get accused of talking about 90 words a minute with, with gust up to 350 <laughs> because I'm about to gust on up. I've been going really slow up until now. So buckle up, all right? We're going to speed this thing up. I'm going to cover as many of these guys as I, I'm cover as many of these guys I can. If I go too fast, it's all on the DVDs over there. And, and the, bad news is the DVD is just as fast as what I'm about to do. But if you know where Rewind is, you'll be, you'll be all right. I mentioned Washington already. Here's the thing about the father of the country was kind of cool. You, it, you look at these paintings of him. You read people that spent time with him. And really, if you want to know whether a founder was a man of faith, spend time with the people that spent time with them. You go read their journals and read their correspondence back and forth. General Henry Knox talked about Washington, how he would walk in during the revolution, accidentally go in his tent, accidentally interrupt Washington. Guess what he's doing? He's praying. You got that right. And the same thing in Congress. Secretary Thompson talked about walking on President Washington. He's kneeling in prayer. You go to Valley Forge. That's the big bronze monument of Washington there. He's kneeling in prayer. The, the stained glass window at Valley Forge, Washington kneeling in prayer. This one's actually the, the, the prayer room of our congressman in Washington, D.C. Right now, their private prayer room is Washington kneeling in prayer. You've all seen the paintings of Washington kneeling in prayer. I, I'm just thinking it's amazing that an atheist founding father spent that much time praying. But if, if we people of faith would pray as much as those atheists, we'd probably be a little better off here in America today. But, but, but there's no question. It wasn't just guys like Washington spending time in prayer. I mean, the most active man at the Constitutional Convention was this guy right here, Governor Morris. He wrote the preamble entirely by himself. He's known as the penman of the Constitution. He spoke 173 times at the convention, influenced the document more than anyone else. Governor Morris, here's what he said. He said, religion is the only solid basis of good morals. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man towards God. Now, did you hear that? Education and religion together. He's saying education should be teaching us to respect the source of our freedom and live that freedom out as a duty towards God. Well, but what did he know? He just gave us the Constitution, right? But he's wanting those two. Today, our Supreme Court says keep them as far apart as possible because of what the Constitution says. And I'm going, wait a minute. Is that the same Constitution that this guy wrote? No, it's not. Because he's referring to the actual Constitution. The Supreme Court is referring to the Constitution, which is nothing but their words that they've made up over the last few years, not what the actual Constitution has to say. Now, you probably recognize these fellows here. That's the 56 atheists that signed the Declaration of Independence. Oh, that's a joke. Thank you for three people knowing that was a joke. Um, they're, they're not only atheists, they're enemies of Christ, we're told. Enemies of Christ. Now, if you're an enemy of Christ in 2017, you can find some things to do, right? Lots of hobbies you can get into as an atheist enemy of Christ in 2017. But what if you're an atheist enemy of Christ in 1776? I mean, what do you do for a hobby? Let's find out what these atheist enemies of Christ were doing for a hobby. This guy back here in the corner, that's the Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon in America, Philadelphia Bible Society. Within a few years, these guys had dozens of Bible societies spreading the Word of God, studying the Word of God. Pretty good for a bunch of atheists to be doing stuff like that, right? 29 of the 56 went to seminary. 
They held what we call today a seminary degree. And, and atheists, atheists and enemies of Christ, I'm sure they were just doing opposition research on this Jesus guy. I'm sure that's all they were doing. Had no belief in uh, Of course not. They were studying for the ministry. No doubt about what these guys were. But look, I don't have time to go into a bunch of them. So this is, this is my, my, my sham wow part of the presentation where I say, but wait, <laughs> there's more. If you go to September 7, 1774, it's the opening session of Congress, first time the United States Congress ever got together. And one of the guys got up and he said, you know, we ought to, we ought to pray. I mean, this is a pretty important moment. Another guy said, no, whoa, whoa, we've got every denomination possible in here. We, we can't pray. Samuel Adams, father of the American Revolution, gets up. He says, I'm no bigot. I can pray with every man in this room. Let's pray. They bring, bring in the Reverend Jacob Deshaies. They pray for three hours, and they had a Bible study where they studied out of Psalms 35, and they said, God spoke to us. In fact, John Adams wrote home to Abigail. He said, Abigail, God so spoke to us out of Psalms 35, we believe for the first time we could actually defeat the British. Tell everybody to study Psalms 35 back home so God can speak to them the same way that he did to us. Silas Dean said it was a prayer worth riding 100 miles to hear. But that's your atheist founding fathers. The last one I'll give you. This is kind of a, just to drive it home. He, he's the least religious of our founding fathers. Most people on both sides agree that he's the least religious, he and maybe Thomas Paine. But Benjamin Franklin's at the Constitutional Convention, and, and these guys are in a position already at 11 years old. We're only 11 years old as a nation, and we've already forgotten our history and forgotten what God had done in our history. And so people are starting to leave the convention. They're giving up. We're not going to be able to reach an agreement on all these key deals, so there's going to be no new constitution. So Benjamin Franklin gets up, and he gives them a history lesson. He says, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Now think about what he's saying. When, when he says, in the beginning, we had prayer in this room, he's basically saying, hey, I was in here. <laughs> I was in this room. It's Independence Hall. I was in there. 11 years ago, when we're trying to take on the greatest military power on the planet, there's no way we could win unless God was on our side. He said we prayed, and then he said, amazingly enough, our prayers were heard, and they were graciously answered. And by the way, he's one of only six to do both, Constitution and Declaration, so he could say this to the other guys. He says our prayers were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And then he asked the question we need to ask right now, what is this, July? What's the day? 29th? 29th. i got to know that. My grandbaby's birthday now, right? July 29th, 2017, we need to ask the same question. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? Listen to what he said. I have lived for a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured of the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. I firmly believe this and also believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and his blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly, but, but only once and in private because if the ACLU finds out they're going to sue us and Jonathan signs and Texas values doesn't exist yet, so we're going to be in trouble. If we wait a little while, then they'll be around, they'll defend us, and we'll win. But no, he didn't say once. He said every morning before we proceed to business. And these guys did that, and it changed everything. They didn't pray every morning there. They actually broke and went and heard a sermon. George Washington said it actually changed all of their attitudes. They were able to reach an agreement. But what happened? That's our least religious, all right? So he sounds like a Bible-thumping evangelical, right? I mean, you, least religious quotes 14 Bible verses off the top of his head in that speech. I couldn't do that. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And he persuades them. Well... You fast forward to where we are now, we're saying no God in the equation. Got to get him out. Started in 62, no, no more, more, uh, more prayer in schools. Ingle V. Vitale next year was having V. Shemp, Murphy, Colette, no more Bible in schools. Uh, then we said you, you can't even pray at a football game. Pledge of Allegiance supposedly unconstitutional because it's got under God in it. Uh, we, we, we talk about you know, pastors now getting arrested for praying on a sidewalk. Pastor in Phoenix spent 60 days in jail because his Bible study was larger than what the city council wanted to allow him to have. Said if it was a football party, he could have it, but not if he was having church. We're, we're running people out of business for simply living their faith and saying, I'm not going to take my art, my gift, my talent that God gave me and use it for something that violates my very conscience. I mean, think about that, even, even not even from a religious perspective, from a free market perspective. We're going to make you do business with someone? And I think I got to get down to this thing. I'm breaking the system. All right, Jonathan, you're going to have to make it up as you go once you get up here. Maybe it'll still work. Anyway, th th this idea that we're going to make you do business with someone and make you actually go perform at an event that violates what you believe. It's absolutely, absolutely incredible. I had a little bit of, of uh, personal experience with this. Just a few weeks ago, I was, I was in Ohio, and I was, I was up there. I was late getting my flyers printed. 
for this, for this event. And so I sent them up to, to Staples overnight to have them printed. I was going to pick them up when I landed. And I wake up the next morning and my email says, we've, we've put your order on hold because it's obscene, pornographic, or dangerous material. And I was wondering who got a hold of my email <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> What, what do you have? What, what flyer are you trying to print? And it just so happens we were one to teach kids about the Constitution. So I, I actually love the fact that y'all used the quote from, from Franklin, a republic if you can keep it. That's the name of our, our government class. So we want to teach kids about the Constitution. That's what our flyer was. But for this guy at Staples, it was obscene, pornographic, or dangerous material. He says, you guys are Christian patriots, and I'm not printing your flyers. Now, I could have... You know, said, I'm suing you. You have to print my flyers because... No, you know what I did? I said, bravo. Absolutely, you have the right to say no to me. You should not have to use your business to support something that violates what you believe. I think that's great. I just want to make sure that I can quote you on the Christian Patriot thing when I put my post out for 200,000 people on Facebook later today. <laughs> Which I did. And the office of the president was calling just a couple hours later. So it was kind of fun. But, but we actually found a printer right there in the same town that printed twice as many flyers for the same price. That's a Romans 828 thing. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord, called according to his purpose. So that was fun. But we, it, you know, Staples apologized, and we're all sorry. I said, no, 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 no. You guys got, you're fine. You're, you can do this. This should be. Let me just say, let's put it this way. People tend to understand this one better for some reason. If, if there's a white supremacist rally down at, the, down at the state capitol next weekend, if they call Lionel Richie and say, we want you to come sing at our rally, does anybody for, any, for even two seconds think that the government should force Lionel Richie to go sing at a white... Now, for those young people in the room, he's a black guy, okay, if you don't know that, all right? <laughs> does anybody think he should have to show up and start saying, hello, is it me you're looking... No, no, right? There is no one on the earth that thinks that he should be forced to go sing at a white... Why then? Why do we think it's okay to tell a photographer or, or, or a baker or a pastor... You're going to take your gift and use it for something that violates everything that you believe in and violates your closely held beliefs. It's crazy. So I have no idea what time I started. Tell me how long I have. An hour and a half? Okay, great. All right, here we go. So, no, no, okay. All right, so i got to rush through this. So the former president, can I just say that again? The former president, that's, that's good. I just love being able to say that. So the, the former president used this, I don't know if you're familiar with this part of the Constitution, the decree clause in the Constitution, but it allows the president to issue a decree that forces every school in America to follow his idea of where people should go to the bathroom. I can't quote which clause it's in. No, it doesn't exist, of course, it's crazy. But he decided he's going to tell every, there's no presidential decree clause. This is awful, it's unconstitutional, it's horrible. But this is how bad it's gotten because we don't know what the Constitution actually says. We're even going to fine people if they refer to a transgender person by the wrong pronoun. Now let me get this straight. It's okay for them to be confused <laughs> about their sexuality but, or their gender, not even their sexuality. But we can't be confused, right? I mean, that makes no sense, but we're gonna, in New York, they're going to find it for that. Now, I somewhat say that jokingly, but let's think about this from a serious perspective. All right, this is right across the border in Canada, and it's coming to a city near you in America. Eight-year-old boy whose parents dress him up as a girl and take him into gay bars, and he puts on a show for the pedophiles and the perverts in that bar who cheer this eight-year-old boy dressed as a girl gyrating on the stage. And the media applauds it. And the government officials applaud it. And they say, isn't this just wonderful? Folks, that's child abuse. Those parents ought to be in jail. But we're celebrating it as a culture now. That's how, that's how bad it is. Okay. Oh, I had the wrong picture up there. Sorry. That's the picture I meant for you to see. This one, this is the girls ought to be hacked off about this. This guy runs in the girls' meet, doesn't even dress like a girl, doesn't even shave his mustache, but says, I feel like a woman, sings some Shania Twain, and they let him in the track meet and go, sing, go run with the girls and wins and has the, his, his time is one second slower than, than the guy's uh, track meet was, uh, one second slower than last place for the guys, but he wins the girl. And the girl that should have won, they go to her and say, right, doesn't this bother you? What? Well, of course, but I can't say anything because then I'm the bad person. Ladies, girls' athletics is gone in five years if you let this continue. It's absolutely nuts. So anyway, that's where we are. That's my, the, the bad part of the, of the presentation. Let me get optimistic for you now. Here's why we got there. We started ignoring this very simple thing. 
The Supreme Court said in 1980 in a case called Stone v. Graham that if you put the Ten Commandments on a wall in a school, they said the kids might see them. If they see them, they might read them. And if they read them, they might study them. And if they study them, they might obey them. And that would violate the Establishment Clause. Now, wait a minute. Let's see. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Sounds like some pretty good things to be teaching, right? But what did we do? We took it out, and we said no more right and wrong. It'd be wrong for me to stand up and say that something is wrong. That, that, that it's, if it's wrong for me, it doesn't mean it's wrong for you. You do whatever feels good. Do whatever's right in your own eyes. And oh, by the way, the student next to you there, I just randomly gathered protoplasm. They're just a pile of atoms. They're not a child of God. They're not a created being. They're an accident. So you do whatever feels good. If you rape them, you're not raping a child of God. It's just a pile of atoms. You murder them. You're not. And then we're shocked that a student can walk into a classroom, take out a gun, and murder a classmate. Friends, we put the formula in place that says don't respect life do whatever feels good to you, and then we get Paducah, Pearl, Jonesboro, Littleton, the list goes on. And every three months on average, another school shooting in America. Not even big news unless it's as bad as, as Sandy Hook. Now, some people say it's the gun's fault. Too many guns. You know, we've got too many guns in America. Fo folks, I could take out my 6C3 45 caliber 1911, and I could set it right up here, and we could stand around it. We could hold hands and chant the rest of the night. It will not jump up and shoot anybody. The gun is not the problem. What's the problem? It's the heart of man. Right? Guns don't kill people. That's close. It's actually Chuck Norris kills people is the <laughs> correct response to that. And, um, but you get the consolation prize at the door. So you know, um, actually, Chuck's great. He's a, he's a, he's a friend and a, and a fellow Texan. Actually endorsed me in the Supreme Court race. The only problem with that is if Chuck Norris has your phone number, this is what it looks like when he calls. Answer, answer. There's no denying Chuck. That's the point. Okay, everybody likes Chuck Norris jokes. So you had it right. People, guns don't kill people. People kill people. You had it exactly right. It's the heart of man. Jefferson had, this is not new. We're not, there's no rocket science. Jefferson put it very clearly. He said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure? So if you don't remember anything else I said tonight, here's the firm basis of liberty. A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God. That they're not to be violated, but with his wrath and need I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Folks, that's the firm basis of liberty. The idea that my freedom comes from God, therefore i got to live my freedom out respecting the authority of God. i got to recognize there are certain boundaries, certain rules to this system if it's going to work and we're going to be free. Now, how do we restore it? Very simple. We the people, especially the church, has to stand up and say, I give or refuse my consent. We the people, especially the church, has got to stand up and say, I'm going to be salt and light. This guy right here is Charles Finney. That's not um, John Travolta from Staying Alive. I know it looks like it, but it's not. It's Charles Finney's Second Great Awakening. He said this. He said, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Whoa, wait a minute. Church, politics? I thought we were supposed to. The church must take right ground in regard to politics. Politics, that's just part of a religion in a country such as this. And Christians must do their duty to their country as a part of their duty to God. What does he mean? A country such as this means a constitutional republic. And in a country such as this, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, we got to know who Caesar is. Guess who it is? It's not the president. It's you. We the people are Caesar. So in a country such as this, if we're going to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, if we're going to do our duty to our country, then we do it as a part of our duty to God, right? So that's why he says God will bless or curse his nation according to the course Christians take in politics. Don't buy this secular spiritual split stuff. There's no such thing. If you leave your faith at home, I mean, have you ever had a great sermon from your pastor said, driving home, you're going, honey, that was a great message. I, I wish we could apply that at home tonight with the family, but there's a separation of home and church. Of course not. Would you say, oh, baby, that was, a, that was a great message, man, on relationships, and I wish I could apply that at work tomorrow with my employees or my employer, but separation of work and church. Of course not, right? Why do we buy into this separation of church and state thing that says you can't take your faith into politics, or if you're a person of faith, you can't be salt and light? Don't do it. I'm going to give you two major challenges. Number one, you've got to live your freedom. You want to honor those who sacrificed? Then you do what Abraham Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address. Everybody remembers four score and 70 years and all that good stuff? The best part of the whole speech is when he says the way you honor those who sacrificed and died for our freedom is you have, quote, an increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. The cause represented by that flag right there is American exceptionalism. It's the formula that produced the greatest, most powerful, most free, most benevolent nation in the history of the world. And how we live out our freedom is to have an increased devotion to that. So we got to know what the freedoms are. we got to stand up for them. And then we got to pass the torch intact to the next generation. I was going to tell you, go study the Constitution. I only have one copy here of Constitution Live. But bottom line is learn those freedoms and then get out there and vote. And don't let me hear anybody say, 
I'm not voting Rick. I will not vote for the lesser of two evils. Because guess what? Unless Jesus Christ is on the ballot, you're going to vote for the lesser of two evils. Every time. There is none righteous. No, not one. Not even you. Right? I have yet to find a candidate I agree with 100% of the time. I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. How am I going to find? There's one person on this planet I agree with 100% of the time. You know who it is? It's my wife. Smart. Yes. Because I don't care if she's right or wrong. She's right. Amen, men? Right? So you're not going to find perfect candidates. So you show up and you do what my mama said. Do the best you can with what you got where you are. Right? You choose the best one. And then you work hard to have better candidates next time. Volunteer. you got some good folks here that are representing you with godly values. Volunteer for them. Contribute to folks. Find people that are willing to run for office and put their name on the ballot and help them get elected. And then speak out. That's lives, fortunes, and sacred honor right there. And you've got to use your voice. So live your freedom. And then lastly, pass the torch. Teach the next generation how to be free. I'm going to leave you with some hope tonight. I'm going to share with you something, and, and I'm going to have, uh, I brought a special guest with me that's going to share for just a few minutes about his experience. We're doing something called Patriot Academy. We've been doing it 16 years now. When I was a legislator, I got frustrated with people saying I'm a conservative, and then they're voting for price fixing and all kinds of left-wing stuff. I said, man, we've got to raise up a new generation that gets it. And I get to work with these young people all over the country, and I'm telling you, God is raising up a remnant that understands what freedom is all about. They, they understand it, they're articulate about it, and they're fighting for it, and they're willing to do what's necessary to preserve our freedom. So I brought one of them with me, a six-time Patriot Academy grad all the way from Austin, Texas, actually serving as a, as a legislative aide for a state rep right now. So he's in the belly of the beast uh, fighting, the, fighting the good fight and going to be headed to Patriot Academy tomorrow. Y'all please welcome Austin Griesinger.